There we go. Now we are seeing your uh, presenter view. Got it. Okay. So let me see if I can swap displays. Uh -huh. Yeah. How do I do that? Exactly. Um, well, I know how to do it. And I was going to. Yeah. Up in the upper left hand corner, there's a thing called swap displays. Yep. There you go. Got it. Super. All right. Well, great. Um, well, welcome everybody. Um, thanks, John, for the introduction. Um, you know, as as John mentioned, I'm at the uh, School of Education at the University of California, Irvine. Um, I do a lot of work in Nebraska, um, and I really taught all over the country. So um, I taught in New Hampshire and Massachusetts, Arizona on the Navajo Reservation, California, um, Tennessee. Uh, Nebraska. So I've really been uh, all over the place. Um, and so, uh, you know, I really love talking with teachers. Uh, I, my uh, fiance is from Michigan. And so we get back to Michigan once in a while. So I'm really glad to be talking with uh, folks from Michigan. So, um, you know, as John mentioned, I'm going to talk about today about teaching tech structures for improving uh, informational text comprehension in students. Um, so specifically informational text, um, or sometimes referred to as expository text, and I might use both terms um, interchangeably. Um, and so, uh, you know, well, and I'll, and I'll explain why uh, informational text in just a second here. So, um, but before I do, I just wanted to so give a nod to um, a couple of my colleagues, Julia Rowling, who's at Georgia Southern University, uh, Ron Nelson, who is now Emeritus Professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and Janet Bohati, who's also University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, uh, we developed, um, developed this presentation based on a lot of their work and my work and, um, and various other researchers who are cited in a meta-analysis um, that I conducted in, uh, with, with all these folks in 2016. Um, so why informational or expository text? Um, why not just comprehension of all um, text material? Um, well, I think that, you know, reading comprehension to me is a very complex uh, thing, and, and it really is dependent on the type of material that you're reading, right? And so, um, so I think that it changes, you know, the way that you approach uh, reading and the way the approach comprehension changes based on the type of uh, material that you're reading. Um, and expository text is, is really the primary source of reading material that we use to present academic content to adolescent students. Um, so really upper elementary, middle school, high school, um, students are, are learning, to, learning a lot of the information uh, that they need for around science, history, social studies, from textbooks or from text material that they read. Um, so it's really important that they understand how to approach that material. Um, so, you know, before I jump into what I think are the reasons why informational text can be challenging for students, um, why do you think, what, what are some ideas that you have around why informational text comprehension might be, might be more difficult or, or particularly difficult for students? Uh, in comparison to narrative text. You want them to come off mute and talk or just put can, it in? Yeah, chat? either, yep, you can either come off mute to talk or if you wanna put things in the chat, that's fine too. I think some students see it as intimidating um, until they start to understand how across content areas, informational textbooks are really designed the same way in the same format, but I think some uh, they're initially intimidated. Okay, why do you think, what, what, so intimidation, so that means they might be, there's some like anxiety levels maybe around it. Why do you think that that might be intimidating for them? Uh, I would guess the language and unfamiliar content, unfamiliar vocabulary and words that they're coming across or don't even know how to pronounce when they see it or don't have any background knowledge on. Yeah, sure. So, so uh, when we, we're coming across new material, new content, um, they may not be familiar with certain topics, right? And and the vocab, like as you mentioned, right? Sometimes vocabulary is very content specific, so it may be a word that and they may come across lots of words that they don't know, right? Um, what else? Sherry says in the chat here, word density and vocab. Absolutely. Yep. So, um, and, and, and so some of these words, you know, might be things that we might only see 
you know, you might come across a word like, um, you know, photosynthesis that you might only see when you're talking about, um, you know, plant life, right? So, so there's, um, there are certain words or, or certain, you know, and, and those words can be very challenging to read as sort of Kate alluded to, right? So some of them are, are really complex in their structure too. What else? Sometimes kids learn early on that their job is to answer questions at the end of chapters in informational text. So all they learn to do is go in and find where the answers are. So the idea of actually reading it and analyzing it for some form of structure is foreign to them. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. That uh, John, we sometimes we set up the task uh, in a way that they're not necessarily reading uh, to learn stuff as much as they're reading to learn how to answer the question, right? Like so <laughs> that they're being posed, um, which is different. You know, I think what we what we need to do probably is try to set up tasks. Uh, to really be more about the overall learning, right? And having kids like sort of explore topics and get really get excited about like learning something new. Um, and we don't always do that. So, well, that was great. So some, uh, my animations didn't come in really that great on that one, but um, so some expository text reading challenges uh, that I came up with are that the structure is different. Um, from things that they might be familiar with, like narratives or stories, right? Narratives and stories have a familiar structure to them. They're characters, there's a setting. Um, sometimes there might be uh, a challenge that the that's faced by the uh, character. Um, there are emotions at play, things like that, right? And there's, um, so there's a familiar structure to it. There's a beginning, a middle, and end. Um, expository text is really different than that, right? So we don't really always have a beginning, middle, and end. There may be a start to the chapter, or maybe like introductions to the material, but it's not really structured in the same way that a story is structured, right? Um, and then, you know, the other thing is that kids don't necessarily have experience with informational text. They don't really have experience coming into school often because, again, they're very familiar with stories. They're not necessarily exposed to a lot of informational text. Um, and then in school before fourth grade, um, you know, back in 2000, I mean, this is, a, this is a little dated, but I think it still kind of um, holds today to some degree. Uh, uh, Nell Duke found that uh, in, in um, before, before fourth grade, kids spent about 3.6 minutes a day on informational text. I think this was really like first in uh, kindergarten, first grade. But that's really not a lot of time looking at informational text, right? So um, there's really not a lot of exposure um, for kids. Um, as we mentioned, vocabulary is unfamiliar and technical. Uh, concepts might be new to students, and they may lack background knowledge around those topics. Um, here's a look, you know, just a, a couple of other things. You know, the density of the facts that that kids learn, right? So um, the other piece to this is that. You know, they may be learning a lot of new facts, but then it's, it's really dense. You're learning all of these facts at the same time, right? Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, informational text might use symbols and abbreviations or graphs or pictures or maps that are also um, not necessarily familiar. And in some cases, um, some of this stuff might be, might not be the highest interest uh, or high, highest readability level uh, for kids. And so th some of those things might be uh, challenging as well. So the purpose of this presentation is to provide uh, you guys with a little bit of an overview of like the five common informational text structures, um, because teaching those text structures can really help give kids a way into understanding informational text, um, kind of a hook for them to sort of grab onto uh, when they're reading any informational text, uh, similar to stories. Um, then I want to pre present some effective instructional components for teaching text structures. So I'm going to teach like some activities and components, like things that I think go really good. And, and really, it's not just that I think, but that are really based on uh, the research, right? So a lot of that we have a lot of evidence for uh, these components uh, around reading comprehension and writing, and then some principles of instruction and assessment around those things. Um, a lot of this work is going to be based on this meta-analysis that I conducted, um, and uh, I'm giving, uh, I've, I've sent this to John so that after this presentation, um, you know, he'll send you a link so you have access to this uh, article. Um, it was in the Journal of Educational Psychology. And what we did is we looked at 45 studies that we could find experiments um, that taught text structures uh, to students when they were teaching informational text reading. Uh, and they compared that to students who didn't learn about text structures. Um, it was uh, 
uh, grades two to 12. And by the way, it was conducted in 2016 and there's been a lot of uh, tech structure work since then. Um, and, and it's still showing that there's um, really strong effects. Um, there are strong effects on sort of the proximal reading outcomes. And what that means is that if we have kids read uh, material and we're teaching them about the structure of that material, then they tend to remember that specific material better, right? So like the stuff that they're reading um, that day, right? But we've also seen transfer to uh, other things, general reading skills, um, untaught structure. So if we teach things like compare contrast uh, or cause effect, um, some of those uh, effects transfer over to things that we haven't taught like problem solution. Um, and the effects seem to be maintained over time. So a lot of really important findings in this um, and I'll, I'll share you know, what, you know, sort of the more practical pieces um, throughout the presentation. Um, we also wrote a practice-based article based on this. Um, it's in the Reading Teacher um, in 2017. Uh, Julia Rowling, my doc student, uh, uh, wrote it with me uh, at the time, and so she's the first author on that. Um, and it includes a lot of the recommendations that I'm going to share. And so uh, I'm also sharing this article with John so that um, you guys will have access to this article too if you want to read uh, a little bit more. Um, so some of the components that I'm going to present on include some of the following things. One is sort of identification of text structure. So discriminating between one text structure and another. So if authors are, um, you know, uh, doing something like describing something versus a compare contrast versus a sequence. And I'll, I'll get into those text structures in a minute, but basically helping kids to identify and discriminate among these text structures. Um, teaching signal words or transition words to help kids understand um, which text structure they're, they're looking at. Um, graphic organizers that help provide a visual representation of that structure so that kids can understand how the information is connected. Um, mnemonics and other memory devices, uh, note-taking, and then writing and self-regulation strategies. So I'll, I'll be going over a, a few of those. The four most common objectives that we've seen in the in the research literature around text structures are um, listed here. Um, so what we've what we've what we see in the literature is that we basically have been trying to find ways to help kids identify the structures of expository text uh, text, um, and they use that then to select and organize the most important information or or how to you know like sort of how to organize that the information in their minds around uh, the topic. Um, how to summarize expository text uh, using um, the text structures, and then how to, how to write their own expository text. So these are the things that we see most commonly, and you can, you can sort of see that these might be pretty important for comprehension. So what I've done is I've organized this presentation uh, around principles for each of these, uh, each of those sort of, you know, topics and activities. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the principles and then I'm going to introduce sort of the activity or um, a way to sort of uh, help kids uh, understand the text structures. So the first principle is to build concept knowledge or build, build conceptual understanding of the text structures. And that really includes identifying those text structures. So what we need to do is, and, and what I need to do with you guys is to introduce um, the five uh, main text structures that we see in informational text. And so I'm going to do that right now. So one thing that we found is that sometimes giving kids icons um, can help them uh, really sort of build a conceptual understanding of the text. And so here are the five basic informational text structures. It's uh, simple description, compare contrast, sequence, uh, problem solution, and cause and effect. Um, these are the ones that we see most common. Uh, they've been identified uh, really Meyer and uh, Bonnie Meyer in like 1986, uh, maybe even a little earlier, uh, started to identify these text structures and, and it's really formed the basis of a lot of the work in this area. Um, so these icons can kind of give you a little bit of a sense of what the text structures, you know, what authors are trying to do with these text structures. So, you know, in the first case you see for simple description, uh, you see a vase sitting on a table and you see uh, then a pencil, um, you know, drawing that, uh, you know, sort of sketching out that vase. Basically what we use this icon to do is say that, you know, simple description is it's meant to, authors use it um, and when they use it, they intend to help people. It's, it's really help 
uh, sorry, the picture is there to represent the picture that you're supposed to get in your mind about when people describe something, right? So authors might describe the shape of something, the size of it, uh, color, they might describe, um, you know, uh, what it does or, you know, uh, really attributes about it. And so description sort of represents that picture that you get in your mind. Um, for compare and contrast, um, when authors uh, compare and contrast things, they generally intend to talk about the similarities and the differences between those two concepts, right? So in this icon with uh, the two hands holding the shapes, um, what we do is we talk to kids about how those shapes are similar and different. Um, a lot of times kids will tell me um, that they're about the same size, um, you know, but that one uh, has a curved side and one has only straight sides. Um, another uh, time, some, uh, some kids told me that um, you know, one, the one on the right actually does have one straight side and, and the other uh, one on the left also has some straight sides. So there's some, some similarities and some differences. They will talk about the difference in color, white and black and um, things like that. Um, the next text structure is sequence. This is a, a, something that you might see a lot in history texts uh, or if we're talking about, um, you know, uh, science texts uh, around, you know, things like the water cycle or life cycles. Um, usually, uh, in a sequence of events, we will have a, a starting event and then, uh, and then events uh, sort of that, that follow. So in the picture here, you can see uh, a plant starting out as a seed and then growing into a sapling and then into a plant, right? Um, and so, uh, there's a sequence of, of events in, or stages of events in this plant's life. Um, you know, you can also use it to sort of uh, talk about historical events, um, things that, you know, sort of sequence of events that happen, um, you know, uh, around important historical, historical sort of um, uh, events that happened. Um, Problem solution is uh, is another text structure that we tend to see where, and this can this can sort of take a lot of forms uh, well, as well. Um, it could be scientific, where we have um, a problem that was solved by uh, somebody inventing something, right? So uh, there was a problem, uh, somebody tried to solve that problem, and they um, invented uh, something new, like the light bulb or um, you know some other invention. Um, and so in this picture, um, what we do is we, we sort of show that there's a problem and then there can be a solution to that problem. Um, and so the, you know, we've got the vase that was in that first uh, icon um, and it's now, now in pieces, somebody broke the vase. And so we've got glue as a poss possible solution here. Um, sometimes we, we will talk to kids about how sometimes solutions work and sometimes they don't. Um, and the, so we may have possible solutions for things. Um, there may also be multiple possible solutions. And then uh, sometimes we choose a possible solution. Um, there may be some solutions like glue that solve more than one problem, right? It can solve like fixing this vase, but it can also solve um, sort of like, uh, you know, sort of putting pieces of a, you know, uh, uh, or gluing a puzzle together or something like that, right? So there's a lot of different things that you can, you can do. And usually are using sort of the same principles, but can solve different problems. Um, cause and effect uh, is the last one. And we've got the bowling ball here hitting the pins and the bowling ball is, is meant to represent the cause. And the effect is uh, when it hits the pins, the pins are knocked over, right? And so um, often we can talk about how um, there may be one causal event uh, in a chain reaction in science, or it could be a causal event uh, or causal, um, you know, uh, yeah, like event or, or action or activity that, that leads to, um, you know, something that, that, or led to, you know, something in history, like a, a war happening or something like that, right? Um, so those, these icons can help build this conceptual understanding around um, the text uh, that we're going to be reading. We also, you know, when we're building conceptual understandings, we like to include student-friendly definitions, and this has been shown to, to really help kids identify text structures. So we've, uh, you know, developed some uh, student-friendly definitions here. Uh, so in one of my papers, uh, Abrar 2016, you're welcome to use these. There's no magic to these specific definitions, except that they're just meant to be really simple explanations. Um, and we, we really focus on what the author is trying to do. And so you can see in the, each of these, we start with the author's intent. So simple description, the author's intent is to tell us about something, they use characteristics or facts to describe it. Um, whereas in, you know, compare contrast, 
the author's intent is to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I lost my cursor there for a second, is to describe a connection between two things. They make connections by tell us, telling us similarities and differences. And, and so we really keep these like uh, definitions simple. Um, we can pair them with the icons and those things have been shown to be effective in helping kids uh, uh, really understand the concepts behind the text structure. Here are a couple more around problem solution and cause effect. I'll just let you guys read those for a second. And so you can see that these, again, these definitions are really meant to be uh, simple and really just help kids understand what the, what the concept is. So, so after we've uh, sort of helped build a little bit of a conceptual understanding around this, um, what, one of the second principles is that we will try to teach more than one text structure. So you know, in this last one, we've seen people, um, you know, they, you can teach all five of these, of course, um, but uh, sometimes we've seen people just teach one at a time. Um, and one of the things that we found in the research is that when, when um, researchers taught more than one structure, um, kids learned, you know, imp improved their comprehension even more, right? Um, and so, and the reason for that is because now they can kind of discriminate between uh, more than one. And as they're reading, they can identify what the author is trying to do to them. So what we try to do is we say, the second principle here is teach more than one uh, structure. And uh, one effective way that we found that this can be done is through discrimination training. So I'm gonna show you what discrimination training is. And that's, that's essentially what we do is we've introduced, we'll introduce two text structures and we ask students to identify the text structure of the passage. So in this case, um, we'd like, I'd like you to go ahead and read this passage and then try to determine which of the text structures is represented, simple description or compare contrast. And so what do we think? Description or compare or compare contrast? Kate says B, Sherry says B. Then you guys are right. This is pretty simple. It's compare contrast, right? So um, so basically, you know, what we do is we can talk about uh, to kids, well, why is it a compare contrast? It seems like um, they're, we're, they're describing things, right? They're talking about storms, high winds. They're telling us a lot of information about, you know, low pressure, the size of these things. Um, but in this case, um, we're talking about two different uh, topics, tornadoes and hurricanes. And they say some of the things that they have that are similar and some of the things they have that are different, right? And so as we've introduced these things, what we tend to do is introduce uh, two of them. Uh, start to discriminate among those two. And when kids start to get really good at, dis at sort of uh, distinguishing between description and compare contrast, then we add in a third sequence and then we'll add in uh, cause effect. And then, we, you know, this gets to be a more complicated task where they're choosing between all five text structures. Um, and what we find is that when kids can identify the text structure, they um, have more of an understanding of what the author is trying to do and what information is important to pay attention to. After we've sort of gotten them to sort of identify text structures and just uh, um, uh, compare and contrast them, what we try to do then is to teach identifying features that are hallmarks of the structures. Um, and so in this case, often we, we will start with their signal words. And you see this a lot in the literature and you might see this a lot in your uh, textbook materials and things like that. Um, and, and I say we, we teach these things, but then there's gonna be a caveat to that as well. Um, so signal words um, are words that, you know, might help you pro provide a signal of what text structure the author is using. So um, in, in the description, they might say things like, oh, it looks like this, or they might provide adjectives that are around like the shape, the size, or the color of a thing, right? So they're really just trying to describe this. And so that might be a signal for, for the author um, as to what your, what text structure they're using. Um, for sequence, you might see sequence words, things like first, second, third, uh, next, or then, or you might see things like dates, um, right? So 
in uh, 1789, um, we saw this, and then in uh, 1790, this happened, right? And so providing a signal in terms of dates. Um, compare contrast, uh, on the other hand, might use things like similarities and differences, or these things are the same in this way, or they're alike, or they're different, or they both have this characteristic, or one difference is this, right? So signal words can um, sort of can signal that you're comparing or contrasting. Um, cause effect, uh, some of the signal words are sort of like, you know, as you might expect, cause and effect, like, you know, this event caused this to happen. And so uh, if you see that word, then that might be a signal of a cause and effect relationship or the word because or led to or as a result of this, this happened. Right. And so um, those things might uh, signal causes and effects. And then finally, for problem solution, you might see the words problem solution, or there was a concern or an issue, or somebody fixed this problem, or there was a resolution and, and things like that. So what I'd like you to do is I want you to go ahead and read this uh, text, and I want you to look for signal words. And then I want you to identify the text structure. And I want you to not only do that, but then tell me what signal words you saw that, that sort of helped you identify um, the text structure. So what are your thoughts? What, what text structure do you see represented here? Kate says pop, possibly sequence. Emily says sequence because of dates. So that's great. So, you know, actually, you know, when, when we wrote this, I wrote this passage with um, a colleague, Janet Bohati, and we, uh, we were intending to write a sequence. And so that's what we did. We wrote, um, you know, when they were built, we put dates in there. We wanted to really show that this was a sequence of events that happened. Um, but then we asked kids. Um, so, well, we asked some third graders to identify the text structure for us. Um, and here's what they said. So we said, which text structure do you think the author was trying to use? Um, and and they, they said sequence because it says first, right? If we look back at this passage, it says the first cars were built in 1769, but first wasn't really meant to be like, this is the first uh, item in a sequence. It was just talking about, you know, the first cars. And so that's, although it's a signal word, it wasn't really meant to um, sort of be presenting a sequence there, but um, the student, you know, identified this. And so, you know, really understands that looking for a structure and was looking for signal words. Our second student said, um, well, they thought problem solution um, and they thought because the passage doesn't have order words, right? So this student was taught to look for things like first, second, third, or then, or next. And as you can see, yeah, we did have the word first, but then those other words weren't used throughout. It wasn't first this, second this, third this, right? Instead, there were these dates, right? And so the student said, well, because of because it doesn't have this thing, I'm going to say problem solution, right? And so what's the problem with that logic? They're just looking for a few keywords, but not really understanding the author's purpose or information from that text. Yeah, so you can see that the focus isn't on the information in the text. It's really focused on, like, we're just looking for these words, right? And that's going to be our signal. And if I don't see them, then I'm going to just guess this other answer. But that does. But I'm not really basing that off of anything. So, so comprehension, I would say, isn't really being activated here, right? Um, then we get to our third student. So this student says problem solution. And they say, because the first kind of cars were not safe and then the new cars were too expensive, then Ford made good and not too expensive cars. So let's go back and take a look at this. This, this was really interesting to us because we didn't intend it to be a problem solution. Um, but you know, we see here, the first cars were built in 1769. 
they were powered by steam. They were not safe and they broke down, right? And so there's a problem. Automakers then started using gas, gas engines in their cars in the late 1800s, presumably because they were more safer and more, you know, uh, because, presumably because they were safer. We, we sort of allude to that in the next sentence um, and they're more reliable, but they're more expensive. So then uh, that's another problem, right? Uh, and then uh, Ford solves that problem with the assembly line. So you can see there's actually a series of problems and solutions throughout this text, right? Um, so we thought, wow, that was really great. We have to be more careful when <laughs> we're writing text. But um, so I guess the, the question that I have for you uh, is that, you know, do you think that this is this happens naturally in a lot of texts that there might be more than one text structure represented? What are your thoughts? I had actually just put that in the chat um, because I, have taught text structure in um, middle school classes and oftentimes there I felt like there were multiple valid ways to identify a text structure so I want to get your take on that. um I do think and I guess maybe I'm maybe more of a wondering for you do you find that it's more important for them to have conversations about why they you know can you back up why you're saying that and really kind of dive into that knowledge of it versus identifying like a cut and dry it's this it's this or it's this yeah i think exactly that's exactly right um so uh, you know i actually have i'm actually a little bit in both camps kate but i think what we want to do is eventually get kids to have those types of conversations and what would happen if they are having those types of conversations right if we have kids like um like this student who says you know, if they're making an argument, well, well, first, the first kind of cars were not safe, and then the new cars were too expensive. And that's why I think that there's a problem and solution here. Well, then they're really digging into um, why this text structure is what it is, right? And they're really digging into the content. And they're sort of thinking about, well, this is why I think this, right? Um, versus just thinking about signal words. So I think those kinds of conversations can really help. Now, even when, when you start talking about the dates, you could say, you know, kids could say, um, well, there are dates in here and it tells me when things um, happen. And that might be really important to me. I might want to know when the first cars were invented and then like how long it took to sort of develop these new cars. Um, and that sort of like helps us understand sort of when cars were more available to people and then what impacts that might have had on history, right? Um, so so you, you think about that information and, and if kids are talking about it in those ways, they're going to really sort of understand the, the text at a really complex level. However, when we're teaching text structure, um, what we might want to do is simplify, right? We might want to, and when we're first introducing these concepts, maybe not start out at that complex level, start out a little more simple and then build the complexity in. And I think that's where you really get the rich um, understanding or comprehension building. And so that's actually leads to my, um, well, here, here I had sort of some slides around looking back, like here are some, we did use some signal words in here, right? Um, automakers began, it started, right? Um, they were the first to use a uh, assembly line and things like that. But then we also included problems and solutions as we saw. Um, so, you know, one takeaway before I uh, sort of move on to my next principle, uh, is that we have to be careful about over relying on signal words, right? What we want to do is we, we can teach kids that here are some hallmarks, but there's a there's a big pitfall there, right? If kids over rely on it, they may just look for the signal words and then they may not be paying attention to the content, right? So we need to teach them to go beyond the signal words and say, well, tell us more about really what's going on in that sequence of events or what's happening um, in this uh, problem solution. Um, we want to start with clear examples. And if we can get kids, this is sort of gets back to Kate's points. If we can get kids to make good arguments about ambiguous examples, we can really start to win the comprehension battle. Their kids are going to really be invested in the content there, right? This brings me to sort of, um, oh, I keep thinking I'm going to be on my next slide. I'm not, what I'm not doing is paying attention to like uh, my presenter mode. I'm really looking just what you guys are saying here. So um, so I actually wanted to have a discussion uh, about this. If we wanted to simplify this, uh, give, you know, we wanted to sort of, um, you know, start with a clearer example. How could we approach uh, teaching um, 
uh, something more complex like this? What would we, so we start with something simpler? How would we approach teaching something more complex? We're not gonna we're not gonna have kids sort of say like, well, this is a simple description or it's just a problem solution. What's what's a way to sort of have a discussion around this? Could we shorten it and take out some of the details that would include that problem solve them solution kind of aspect to it? Absolutely, right? So I think what one, one of the things you're saying here is we could say the first cars were built in 1769. Um, then gasoline engines were developed in the into late 1800s, right? And then uh, Henry Ford uh, started the Ford Motor Company in 1903. And, and we could even include like when the assembly line was actually developed, right? Or if that, if, if that was in 1903. Um, and so by doing that, you're really simplifying and, and changing the focus there uh, for the kids, right? Um, so you can kind of use these structures to then guide what you want kids to, to pay attention to um, for their comprehension. All right. Now I'm on to my fourth principle. So although we can really get into these complex things, what we really want to do is introduce uh, something with a clear, clear examples before we introduce that complexity. So we want to use simpler text. Um, and I got way ahead of myself here because that's what I was going to have. <laughs> this is basically what I had Kate just talk about was rewriting the passage to, to really represent one structure. Um, and so, uh, so sorry about that. I kind of just got ahead of myself there. What if we wanted to write this to focus on problem, the problem solution structure? How could we rewrite it uh, in another way? So could we expand on some of the problem here? Um, so yeah, Beth is, is sort of set, suggesting, oh, focus on how the cars were powered, right? So we could say, I want to know like how cars were powered. Um, you, we could even have a little discussion about that before we have the kids read. And we want to say, now we want you to focus on you know, how they're powered and what the problems are around that. Even if just telling the kids, we want you to focus on you know, what the problem and solution is can really help focus their attention in that way. So we could rewrite a passage or we could sort of help guide the students uh, in a particular way. All right, now I wanna share, uh, I want you to do another activity. What I'd like you to do is identify the text structure or structures of this passage. All right, so what are your thoughts on this passage here? Can you see any text structures represented? Kate says simple description. Sherry thinks description as well. So, I do see description in here, and we intended there to be a, a description in this. Um, do you see anything else? Is there any other part that you can, you can kind of see inklings of another text structure? Sherry says sequence in the first paragraph, right? So um, talking about, and maybe it's because we see the dates in there. So where they were first used, how they spread um, and, uh, and then how they were used later, right? 
uh, Beth says problem solution potentially, and Kate says problem solution. Where do you see the problem and solution? Uh, I was looking at it as how wind turbines are used, like how they're used today to help us produce electricity. And they're sure. yeah. supposed to be safe, but not always. So I was looking at maybe how they would help us. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, th there are two really like that. That's really insightful. I hadn't really thought about um, you know how it's being used, right? So for pre to pre prevent flooding, that that is a, a solution, right? Um, and then to produce electricity, that's a, that's something that's that's helpful. Um, we don't. It's not really focused so much on what on what it's trying to solve. You know why we need to produce electricity. So like what the problem is, but there is a solution there and how, how these things help us. But in that last paragraph, you also mentioned that wind turbines are generally considered to be safe, but they're not always safe, right? And so if you read through that, it's like, oh, to prevent that, uh, from to prevent things like birds, um, uh, from birds from being killed, that we can avoid building them in flight paths, or we can use radar to detect approaching birds. So those are potential solutions to the problem of the turbines not being safe for birds, right? And so, um, so absolutely, I see some elements of problem and solution there. What else? Uh, see any other things in there? I mean, I'm, I might not. So I think what the, you, you know, in the three that I was really thinking is like, there's description in here. There's, um, you know, sequence of sort of how they were developed and when they were developed. And then we've got these elements of problem and solution in here. Um, so what do you think, uh, you know, do you think that a lot of uh, sort of textbooks or do you think authors might use multiple text structures often in their, in their, writing i think kate, you know kate mentioned earlier she she thought that she saw that in textbooks previously so um but did did looking through this and thinking about the text structures help you think about the information in any particular way I think when kids had conversations about text structure, it definitely deepened their knowledge of what they were reading about because they were forced mm -hmm. to pinpoint why they named it something or would categorize it as something. Right. Um, and so I think it also, you know, helps them just grab more information. I don't know. I always enjoyed the, and initially I was kind of caught up on the, huh, like the author of this textbook said it should be this, but I was in agreement with the kids or what they were saying. And I felt like that they mm -hmm. could defend it. One, they were truly understanding what they were reading, but two, like, I'll give you credit for that. You just totally explained yourself and find found reasons from within the text. Right. Yeah. And I think that that is the important part of it, right? I think that it's more important for them to have conversations about the information and why the information is important, what, what the author is trying to do, than it is about being right about which text structure it is, right? Um, so being able to defend why is, is what, what I find moves the needle more for kids uh, in, in the research that I've been doing. Um, and so, you know, what we, what we do find is a lot of times that, that authors might start out describing something and then they might go into comparing that that concept to something else. They might talk about problem solutions. So they kind of go in and out of these different text structures um, because their purpose might change uh, as, they're, as they're trying to give you information about uh, a topic, right? And so what we need to do is help kids understand that um, authors might have uh, different purposes as they're presenting information and that helping uh, like sort of understanding that there may be different text structures represented can really help us understand the con those concepts. I wonder, Michael, if overviews or introductions to a, something might have more changes throughout its text in terms of structures, just because, well, they're going to give you a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and the, as opposed to maybe a science paper that was totally devoted to a certain cause and effect. 
Yeah. Um, so, so say more about that, John. What you're. I'm wondering if, like, middle school where they're getting introduced to a subject, and then you, so you've got maybe first they're going to tell you describe it a little bit, then they're going to compare it to something the kids already know, and then they may get into here's why it's important, so maybe some cause and effect or something like that. Yeah, I think that you might see that, and you know, I think. Again, it really depends on the, I, I think you kind of hit on it, right, when you men mentioned like that science text might be focused on a particular cause and effect relationship, right? Um, it really depends on the author, right? And one of the things that's really important is to help kids understand that, that, that um, authors, every author has a different purpose for um, what they're trying to do with, with the text and what they're trying to do with the information. Some authors might be trying to give you a broad understanding of, of a topic where they might use multiple text structures, and some might be focused on something very narrow, right? Might be just trying to share share with you uh, a cause and effect relationship and really try to help you understand that cause effect relationship. So helping kids be prepared to identify and discriminate among these text structures throughout and saying that authors, you know, helping them understand that authors might use multiple text structures, um, you know, within the same passage or even sometimes uh, at the same time. And, uh, and Beth, yeah, you mentioned, you, you sort of hit the nail on, you were saying basically the same thing I said there, you know, depends on the author's purpose for writing the, uh, the article, you know, and so this really leads us into sort of to helping us think about what does the author want us to know? And one of the things that's really powerful about that is helping kids understand that reading and writing are communicative acts, right? That um, as a reader, my what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to understand what the message is that the author, what does the author really want me to know? And it, knowing that this is a conversation, they're trying to, they, they sort of maybe assume some things that I might already know, they're sharing information with me in a certain way, um, but the, they're trying to communicate something to me and, and I'm trying to figure out what they're communicating. And then as a writer, in the same way, I can also share information in a particular way with someone um, that might help them understand uh, a topic, um, you know, a, a little bit um, better if I, you know, or it might be, I might be trying to communicate something specific, right? So really understanding that this is a communication, you know, tool, right? The reading and writing are communication tools. So one thing that we can do, uh, if, if we want kids to uh, really think about what an author's trying to do uh, and, and, and how to facilitate the understanding, uh, you know, or, or maybe we, if we want the kids to take away something is to help them think about these structure related elements and then give them some guiding questions. Um, so guiding kids thinking toward a specific thing. So let me give you an example here. So here are some examples. This is uh, a lot of this is from uh, Joanna Williams's work. Um, where she might, she sort of described helping even second graders understanding, um, you know, so asking things, what is the author describing here? What are the details that the author uses to describe it, right? And so again, getting them in, uh, to defend um, a little bit more about not only what the text structure is or what it's describing, but telling a little bit more about why, right? Or compare and contrast, what objects, concepts, or categories are being compared? How are they the same? How are they different? Right, you're again. You're you're helping kids focus on those specific similarities and differences. Um, sequence. What's the first thing that happened? What happens next? What happened uh, then? What happened last? Right, helping kids uh, sort of put an order to those things. Um, or problem solution. What were the difficulties uh, or questions that the pe people were trying to solve? And then what were the attempts or possible actions to solve them? And how how was it or how might it be solved? How might this problem be solved? Um, and then, you know, cause effect. What are the causes and related effects? So you can ask very general questions um, like this that will help help bring kids attention to that text structure. But questions can also be more specific. So they can vary in specificity here, right? So one of the things that we found in our work is that we can ask, you know, what are the causes and effects? And that can be pretty powerful. But we can also have some more specific questions. So like if we think about that gasoline engine, uh, you know, example that I shared, 
rather than just saying, what are the problem solutions? We could ask more uh, specific questions like what did people use before the gasoline engine? And then what was the problem with the gasoline engine? Then kids are really looking for those problems and solutions and really sort of honing in on, on that piece of it. And then how did they make gasoline engines more affordable? And then that can, again, um, sort of indicate that there was a problem uh, or there was something that needed to be solved. And this is how they, they solved that problem. So what I'd like to do now is have you guys uh, just have some practice developing guiding questions. So here's a, a passage on the Transcontinental Railroad. Sorry, it's a little bit blurry, um, I'm noticing. Um, but uh, so what I'd like you to do is read through this and then and think about what's the text structure and then what information do you think is important as a teacher and how would you guide students to think about the text structure and how that might, whoops, how that might help them. Sorry, there we go. How that might help sort of uh, guide students thinking to a particular area. So go ahead and read through this and then come up with some guiding questions. You can put them in the chat um, or you can you know, bring yourself off mute. What was the purpose of the railroad? Um, so that might, you know, if, if uh, I see a question like that and I think, oh, uh, maybe I'm, I'm thinking about there's uh, potentially a problem solution here, right? So it's like there's there's a purpose, there's something that's, that needs to be solved, right? What were the long-term benefits? Um, so uh, let's see, that, is, that sort of seems like it is more of an inferential type question, right? So I think, um, you know, in this case, I don't see uh, an answer for that directly, but again, I think it helps us focus on, is there a problem or solution in there? How long did it take to initiate and build the railroad? That's great. Uh, that's a really interesting question um, because it's it's sort of like now kids have to do a little bit of math, right? They have to look at those dates and realize, oh, there's a date when things started and then there's something when it when it finished. And I can kind of understand how long it took to do this, right? And that that can really that can really focus kids' attention on the timeline, right? How long, man, this is a long process, right? Um, so those are great guiding questions. I think, you know, you could, you can ask kids to sort of also do things like, um, you know, put the dates on a timeline. You, can you, can you develop a timeline and show when certain events happened? And that will really help kids focus on the sequence of, of these events and, you know, when things happened. Um, so that's another uh, approach that you can take, right? Uh, so the next principle that I would like to talk about after you've, after you've, all right, so now we've, so far we've, taught kids what the text structures are, built a conceptual understanding, taught kids to discriminate among them, looked for things like signal words, um, helped kids, um, uh, sorry, we asked guiding, guiding questions uh, about these things. Um, now we can teach kids how to use that information that we know about to select and organize information. And one really key thing that we find to be very effective in, throughout the literature is graphic organizers, right? Graphic organizers can really help provide a visual representation of uh, these structures. So here are some examples of graphic organizers. Um, you can see a topical net. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you guys, but you know, what, what do you, uh, well, I guess some of these sort of, uh, they, they indicate right below them, which, uh, which text structures they are, but the topical net for say Jupiter, we've got fifth planet from the sun, third brightest object has rings and moons, 
what what text structure is represented there? It's a description, right? Yeah. So Kate says it's a description. It's it's right. It's we're we're providing facts, um, adjectives to describe uh, this thing. And so I'll, I'll I'm going to go through each of these a little bit more here. Oops. You can see there's a uh, uh, simple description. We've got Jupiter at the center. Uh, you can really do this with any topic. You know, you can put the topic at the center, and then you can have uh, different um, spokes coming out from it that sort of describe that uh, thing, right? Um, compare contrast. Uh, this might surprise people. I didn't put a Venn diagram in here. Um, I like to use uh, matrix uh, just because I think everybody, a lot of people know what a Venn diagram is. Um, this is just an, another alternative uh, that you could use. And so, you know, you can see that our topics are represented here at the top, horses and oxen. Um, and we have categories that we're comparing these uh, horses and oxen on, on the left-hand side. So one category is speed. Horses are faster uh, than oxen. Uh, strength, oxen were stronger, right? Uh, cost, oxen are less expensive, or they were less expensive. Uh, this is sort of, um, this came from a, a reading passage in particular. Uh, and then the food that they eat, you know, so um, that sort of, uh, sort of shares, um, you know, sort of one way that, that we can compare these, these ideas. For sequence of events, often we can you can use things like arrows. I really love using arrows, um, things like this, right? You can put boxes and you can sort of include. Um, this is for building a terrarium uh, or making a terrarium, and it's just sort of a linear string. This, you know, do this first, uh, then do this and, and do this next. This is great for um, how to's, right? So if you want to how to do something, often we can do things in a sequence, right? Um, like this. Now, uh, could there be multiple approaches? You know, do you, you know, in some cases, um, there might be uh, two ways to do something, right? So like for making a sandwich, you could put the meat on first or you could put the cheese on first, right? You could, you, there are multiple ways that you could sort of do it and you can kind of share with kids that, that there's sometimes more than one potential sequence um, for things, but um, just, just to kind of share uh, some variation in these uh, structures. Cause effect. Um, in this case, I also like to use some arrows. Um, and what we do, we need to do is sort of kind of explain to kids that these arrows are a little bit different, right? But um, that that really what, what we're doing here is saying that this thing caused this other thing to happen. Um, it's sometimes in a sequence of events, one thing happens, then another thing happens. And it's not that the thing that happened first was the cause or that you know it led to the other. Um, but in the case of cause effect, there might be a sequence. And in this case, the thing that happens first is the cause and it, and it's inevitable that the effect is going to happen. Right. So like glaciers moving, um, the effect is that it carved deep basins in the earth, right? It, if the glaciers didn't move, those basins wouldn't have been carved. Right. And so there was a, a clear cause and a clear effect. Um, if one thing happens, the next thing has to happen, right? Um, Earth's climate warmed and melted the glaciers uh, that filled in basins with water. So there's another cause and another effect, right? Um, and so uh, that's sort of a, you know, sort of talking about the difference between sequence and cause effect is important. And then problem solution, um, again, similarly to uh, cause effect, there may be, again, more than one cause, more than one effect. In this case, there might be one cause that leads to, sorry, one cause that leads to multiple solution, multiple potential solutions. Well, we've got static electricity here. We could solve that multiple ways, right? We could either use dryer sheets, we could use a spray, or we could let clothes air dry. Or you might have one solution that might solve more than one problem, right? Um, uh, things like that. So just teaching kids that there are different, um, you know, solutions or potential solutions. You don't have to use uh, all of the solutions. And some solutions might be better than others, right? So, so talking to them about those things too. So here's a little activity. Um, what I'd like you to do is, uh, I'm glad that Daria liked um, the matrix because now I want you to make a matrix, right? So we had that matrix previously. Um, what I'd like you to do is sort of take, take time to sort of put topics in the matrix. 
um, you can put, you know, you've got two things that are being uh, compared and contrasted, and then maybe the categories that they're being compared and contrasted along, and then putting in similarities and differences um, by, by putting in into a, a box. So just take a minute, um, either on your computer or pen and paper, however you like to do it, and just sort of take a minute to try to create a matrix organizer. What I'm hoping here is that um, you're gonna sort of see that this is a little bit more challenging than it might seem on the surface. And I want you to think about, you know, what is it, how does it make you think differently than um, sort of some, maybe a simple Venn diagram might. So Sherry hit on exactly what I what I wanted you to hit, what I what I wanted her to hit on there, and it's deciding categories, right? That's challenging. It's a little bit different, right? So instead of just saying, um, "Oh, you know, there uh, one's a unicameral, one's a bicameral," it might be you. You might say, "Oh, there are um, different." You might have to say, "Oh, the number of houses that it, that the governments have is different, right?" And so you have to come up with that overarching category. Right or the ways that they uh, make laws and govern the state, um, or or the things that they do. Right, so there I kind of fell into my own trap. Right, so um, both governments make laws and govern the state. So what their purpose is for the government is to make laws and and govern the state. So you might say, oh, the purpose of the governments is the same. Right, um, and so you have to come up with that overarching category. And that makes you think a little bit more deeply about how these things are similar and different, right? So it's a little bit different than just sort of filling out a straight Venn diagram. Beth says Venn diagram has more opportunities for interpretation and the matrix is a little bit more specific. Yeah, I think that's true. Michael, this matrix, I have a great book on teaching history and they say, if you wanna like compare countries, economies, there are seven topics, maybe. I, I'm thinking the country name would go down the left-hand side, and correct me if I'm wrong, and across the top, the topics would be labor, natural resources, tools and equipment, money and credit, transportation. You know, just those factors go across the top, and so you have this nice, well, you can really quickly pick up things that are similar amongst different countries and th things that are different. Absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, I use tables a lot in my work, uh, you know, because in research work can be really, really complicated, right? But if I'm, if I'm sharing uh, things across a lot of studies and I'm comparing them, often making a table where I'm like, oh, each of these studies, here are some factors that, you know, oh, these are all, these all have these features to them. These all have these other features, right? And so you can kind of see that in a visual way a lot faster, 
right? And you can find information, but you know, kids have to learn how to how to um, manage those or, or really how to use those organizers too. So, um, so we have to make sure that we, we realize that um, we can't just make these things and expect kids to, to really understand how they work. We've got to teach them how they work. That's great. So another principle of really good uh, text structure instruction is to use writing to then facilitate comprehension. So now, you know, I think we did a little bit of that here where I had you guys write um, using a graphic organizer. Um, sometimes we might just show kids the graphic organizer, right? We, we could just show them um, organizers that, you know, here, this is how this information is organized. Um, but going a step beyond is having them actually write to uh, facilitate their comprehension of this material. So uh, I'm going to show share note taking and summarizing. These are um, both um, strategies that uh, I talked about last week in my presentation about writing to read. When we have kids write about uh, text that they've read, um, they're more likely to uh, understand that text, to comprehend that text. Um, and so we, if we, what we found is if we have kids take notes about the text, they are more likely to remember the information. Even if uh, we don't tell them how to take notes, they still are more likely to remember information. But it's even stronger if we give them a structure for that, right? And so that sort of leads into sort of this talk here where I'm going to share like, oh, different note-taking structures, you know, along the lines with, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, graphic organizers. And then having kids write summaries of text really helps them uh, really get to the heart of what is the most important information in the text, right? So um, one off alternative to graphic organizers are is something that I came up with called note frames. Um, these are essentially graphic organizers, but it's just a slightly different take on it. Um, so in this case, um, you know, I made a really simple note, note frame uh, where we ask it, we tell ask kids to identify the structure. We then talk about what's the topic, and then we have listed like causes and effects. So you can see on the left hand they have to talk about the causes, and on the right hand uh, side they include the effects, and then they can draw arrows uh, from those uh, causes to the specific effects, right? And, and they've got them numbered. So on the left hand side, the glaciers moving. Um, that's the first cause, and that helped carve deep basins in the earth. And then the second cause is Earth's climate warming, and that led to two sort of effects, right? Melted the glaciers and water melted, uh, filled in the basins. And so you've got multiple, one cause leading to multiple effects, or in some cases, one cause leading uh, to one effect, right? Um, and so, uh, so that's one option is to do that. I like them a little bit better for uh, some than Venn diagrams in some cases. Um, and I like to show these examples uh, just because I think that I'm wondering if you guys have had this experience where you might have kids who try to fit, you know, that little, that, what, what, how, the, how the, the sort of what's in the middle there, what's alike around these two topics can be very uh, hard to sort of fit in. Like sometimes the space is really small and kids can have a real hard time fitting in the information that they want to put in there. In there. This student tends, you know, on the left-hand side, tend to have have, have pretty good um, uh, handwriting, you know, and so looks pretty good. But if you've ever worked with students who have poor handwriting skills, um, they can get really messy and they can have a really hard time uh, identifying like what's what's in the middle there, and then what on the left goes with the things on the right. And so you can see this uh, even on the left-hand side here. This uh, transverse waves to uh, right waves uh, or night waves. And you can see that there's an arrow drawn, drawn from one side to the other because uh, the student has to try to connect those ideas because if, we, if they didn't do that, then we have to really sort of try to identify which bullets on what side, on the left-hand side go with the ones on the right-hand side. Um, the Venn diagram on the right is, is uh, not something that what any of my students came up with. It's, uh, it's also just sort of a cautionary tale, right? So like here we've got, um, you know, students putting in whatever they want here. So they put us versus slaves, which is not necessarily the greatest topic, right? So especially if they're saying us, uh, hopefully uh, they're not looking at themselves as like, well, we're, um, you know, we were the people that were not slaves versus the people that are. Um, and so there can, you can get into some, some kind of uh, sticky areas there. 
but then uh, also you get like things like, oh, we have washing machines and we have uh, a store and microwaves and that the slaves did not have those have microwaves, um, which is really kind of a, a, you know, we get you can get some strange ideas there. So we want to teach kids to stick to the topics that are that are in the um, reading as well. Here's an example with some scaffolding. So I want to share with you um, sort of how I uh, show kids how to stick to the reading um, with compare contrast. So you, you see, I've got this note frame. Basically what I'm doing here is it's, I've got structure listed, topics, similarities and differences. And so what I want to do is I want to, first thing I do is I teach kids to read through the text. So choosing between horses and oxen to pull wagons was a tough and important decision for pioneer families. Horses moved faster, but they were not as strong as oxen. They were also more expensive and needed grain and hay to eat. Oxen moved more slowly, but could pull heavier loads. They were less expensive and they would eat grass along the trail. So, hmm. I think that in this case, you know, there's a comparison being made between horses and oxen. So what I wanna do is I can see, I can highlight the horses and oxen here to show the kids that, oh yeah, there's this, choosing between horses and oxen. So there's there's the topic, right? So the structure is gonna be compare contrast here, and then I'm gonna write in horses and oxen. Now, if this is a compare contrast, I have to think about how things are similar and how things are different. So some reading through, well, it was a tough and important decision. That isn't really a similarity or difference. That's just telling me something that um, like what, you know, that this was, they're, they're, they had to make a choice. Um, so let's see, horses move faster, <clears throat> but they were not as strong. So something that is, uh, that's a difference, right? Horses move faster. I can see the ER faster. That means that oxen were slower. And it does say that oxen moved more slowly. So maybe the speed that they move um, is different. So I can, uh, well, sorry about that. Um, the other thing is like they, they, they both uh, can pull wagons. Uh, so that's a similarity. Um, and sort of highlighted that there. Um, horses move faster, but oxen move more slowly. So I can put the speed as a difference. Um, and it also says horses were not as strong as oxen. So strength, the oxen are stronger um, at, than horses. They also mentions that, that one was more expensive than the other. So um, it was said they also were more expensive. Now I have to use my, um, you know, my, my clues here, because I've got a pronoun, they also were more expensive. So I have to think, who are they? And, and oh, well, the previous sentence talks about horses. So they are the horses. So horses move faster, but we're not, uh, but we're, uh, I'm sorry, horses were the ones that are more expensive there. And then they also needed grain and hay to eat, um, but oxen could eat grass along the trail. <clears throat> and so food, the type of food that they eat is different. Horses need grain and hay and oxen uh, eat grass. So one thing that we want to do is maybe model. We can highlight for, for kids where the similarities and differences are and then show them how to take notes in this way. In a research study example, when we taught kids how to use note frames to take notes like this, um, we found some, some really good results. We, in, we did this study with fourth graders that had reading difficulties all around age 10. Um, you can see that uh, based on the, uh, their, you know, the reading scores on this, uh, this TOS rec is the test of silent reading efficiency. They all were lower performing readers. Um, their word identification skills were uh, lower than, slightly lower than average, and their word attack scores were slightly lower than average. Here's a pretest example of uh, some kids taking notes about uh, a text structure. So turbines can kill birds and, and were invented in 200 BC. And then here's what we were able to get kids to do um, later. So we, they were able to say, oh, the topic in this case was the Transcontinental Railroad. It was a timeline. Um, and so Congress first authorized it in 1862. In 1863, they built West. And then in 1869, they met in Utah. So the kids are really focused on like, when did these different events happen and how long did that take to happen? Here's another example with compare contrast. Um, now, you can see in this case here, we had a frame for them. And what we taught kids to do is first, you know, how do you, you know, take notes in a frame like this? But then we start to take, um, take the frames away. And now we're having kids write their own notes uh, just on paper, right? So you can see here, 
there's no uh, scaffold. We took the scaffold out and now they have to write in, oh, the structure is compare contrast. The topic is federal versus state governments. Here are the similarities and then here are uh, the differences. And so you can see that kids are really focused in on that, on that information. Here's another compare contrast. Uh, here's another compare contrast example. A different kid, but uh, same same thing there. What we saw was that kids, in, you know, just in the number of idea units that they took notes about, um, improved over time. Now Peyton uh, started out with like just one or two pieces of information, and then uh, in intervention did pretty well, and then um, you know we started representing four or five pieces of information. Now what was important to know here is it's not just the amount of information, but also that they were really focused on specific things uh, related to the content. Um, you can see Bob here really didn't really take any notes when we asked them to take notes and, and remember information. But then at the end of the intervention, uh, took a lot of notes, except for on July 3rd, when he was really interested in, in fireworks and why am I not out <laughs> watching the fireworks. Um, Snickers, uh, we had kids sort of choose their own names. One choose chose Snickers. You'd say really didn't produce any notes, but then I was able to produce a lot of notes. And uh, when we noticed that these things did improve their reading comprehension. So just teaching kids how to take notes uh, is really helpful for them. Um, here's an example, a three paragraph example. We asked kids to, um, to take notes, to identify the text structure, and then take the notes on each of the paragraphs. So um, I won't have you read through this entire thing, um, but uh, there are three different text structures represented. And so uh, you can see that the kids, you know, this is uh, an example of one student. First they wrote, uh, this is about the first paragraph, problem solution, Top, topic was Lewis and Clark. The problem is that there's a new land and the solution was that um, they, they uh, sent uh, Lewis and Clark to study it. The second, was a compare contrast where they were comparing um, uh, Lewis and Clark and uh, how they contributed to the uh, to the um, mission, right? The similarities between these, they both contributed valuable skills. Uh, and then what each person you know what each per person was able to bring to the table. So Lewis was responsible for um, for leading and and um, uh, marking animals and things like that, that they saw. And Clark was responsible for making maps and led the hunting. And then um, uh, this is the sequence of events uh, that was in the third. So, uh, so the student wrote in the third paragraph, it was a sequence, Lewis and Clark, um, you know, was the topic and then the order that they did things uh, and when they, when they started their journey and when they ended their journey. Right. So you can see that the students really um, started to identify that there are different things that the author is trying to convey, and this is how they were conveying that. Um, I guess I'll pause there and just sort of see, you know, do, are there any questions about uh, note taking using uh, this, this sort of structure and, and or any comments about the kind of um, uh, comprehension we're listening here? No, I just think it's so valuable to explicitly teach kids how to take notes because I um, look at my own kids bring things home and I have one that is just real scattered and he's like, look, mom, I took notes. And I thought, oh, my Lord, what is that? Like, and I didn't say that out loud, but I just thought, man, he needs to, you know, learn how to um, definitely organize that a little bit better. And once he was able to, it was so much easier to help him study, just even showing him kind of that two column, right? Look at this is like your study guide right here. You can mm -hmm. take this and then just how beneficial it is as they move down the road into high school and beyond um, right. the amount of notes that they have to take, even if, you know, whether it's typed or written or whatever, I get that a lot of it is typed, but um, just to have the organizational skills to very basically get your thoughts out is super helpful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, you're right that that some of these you know, there's there are a lot of apps out there now and that a lot of this can happen on the computer and that um, they have really uh, some uh, graphic organizer development software where you can go in and you can develop your own graphic organizers and take notes right in there. Um, and that can be really helpful and valuable, too. Um, 
you know, we, we were doing this with just paper pencil because that's what basically the kids were that we were working with were, um, they were more familiar with these. It, it was the mode that they preferred to write in more. So we were using paper pencil, but some of those tools can be really valuable to extensions of uh, this work. So, you know, I guess the, the other thing here is just, just sort of, again, coming back to, you know, what is the author trying to tell us in this passage about Lewis and Clark, um, right? And you can, you can kind of really see here, if the student's taking notes first, they're saying, they're identifying that there's a problem. There's a reason that Lewis and Clark um, went out uh, to explore this territory, right? There was this vast unknown ter territory that they had to, to, to uh, explore and, and learn about um, and bring information back. Um, the reason that we had both of these guys that they had different skills and, and that can really help you help them understand why, um, you know, the roles that these guys played and then the timeline, when did this happen, right? And so, so by sort of focusing in on the text structure, these kids sort of really can, can uh, get a really, broad understanding of what the author was trying to convey to them. Right. Um, so moving on, we can look at summarizing informational text as well. That's another way to have kids, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, write about text. And so after kids have filled in graphic organizer for taking notes, um, they can use it to write their summaries. So, you know, again, we've shown that um, having kids write summaries of text can improve their reading comprehension. They, and, and that happens because students put the information into their own words, they're intentional about the ideas, and they show connections among the ideas. Um, here's an example from uh, jo uh, Joanna Williams's work. Um, and so I have a passage here, tornadoes and hurricanes are large storms. We, we sort of read uh, this passage or similar passage uh, a little while ago, so you can kind of read through it. Um, but then she used what, what we call a closed format prompt where, you know, uh, basically kids would uh, have this closed format and this is for second grade students. Um, so she would say this paragraph is about blank and blank. They are similar in some ways, for example, and then the students fill in, and then they are different in other ways. For example, and then they the students write. So uh, let's just briefly talk about this. You know, the paragraph is about uh, is about what? Tornadoes and hurricanes. Tornadoes and hurricanes. Thanks, Kate. <laughs> and so they're similar in some ways. And so um, so can anybody tell me how they're similar? Both are large storms. They're both large storms, right? They both have high winds. Um, thanks, Sherry. Uh, thanks, John. So, right, so they're similar in some ways. And so you can see that kids will then write these this sum down and then they're different in other ways, for example, and then they write those things down. Um, so again, what we're doing is we're having kids uh, pay attention to specific information. They're including that information uh, in their writing. And so they're intentional about the ideas and they're more likely to remember those ideas. All right, so then um, another thing that I like to do is I, I like to have kids write informational text using, te using text structures, right? So one of the things that we've learned is that as kids, um, if kids are writing more, then they become better readers, right? So if kids understand how to, how to write uh, more complex sentences, then they're, they get better at reading more complex sentences. Uh, if we can teach kids to write informational text using text structures, then um, they, can, they can then uh, read uh, this text uh, in a more sophisticated way, right? So one of, the, one of the things I'd like you to do right now is write a paragraph about the Rio Grande River, right? So I wanna, and this, so I'm just gonna have you guys write about something. Um, I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to write. I want you to write about the Rio Grande River and I want you to include at least three facts. Uh, and then I want you to, um, uh, yeah, just, just write for two minutes, include at least three facts about the Rio Grande River. Right. So uh, go ahead and take a minute to either type or write uh, using paper pencil about the Rio Grande River. And then we'll talk about what happens when we assign these kinds of tasks.
I'll give you one more minute. Okay, that's probably about right, about enough time. So we're going to finish up whatever last uh, thing you're thinking about there. Uh, so how was that for you? And one of the things I want to ask is like, you know, how do you feel about your paragraph? Uh, does anybody want to share their paragraph? <laughs> Sherry says it's boring. <laughs> Great. Okay, you, that's great. You typed it right in there. Um, all right. Uh, Michael, I wrote about my own experience with it and surprised that I ran across the Rio Grande actually in Colorado and then in New Mexico because I, I always thought of it as the border between Mexico and yet its origin is actually in California or in Colorado. Then I uh, we could wade across it in Big Bend National Park to get to the Mexican side. So it's very shallow. So it was all about my own experience with it as opposed to having any real deep knowledge about it. Right, right. So you 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 approached it from that perspective. Uh, it looks like Kate um, wrote a lot. So you, Kate, tell us a little bit. You have uh, it looks like you had a lot of knowledge about the Rio Grande. Well, I wasn't really sure where to take it, so I just started typing. But I um, have been in seventh grade for a really long time as a special ed teacher and have worked with the seventh grade curriculum and so I just kept I then went back to like ancient civilizations and everybody had to live near a water source and I was like oh I don't know I, I you know it wasn't necessarily I don't know so I just started spewing information that I knew about because sure. I'd been in that kind of topic area for a while yeah <laughs> several other people have commented that like this was a little open-ended they weren't really sure what the expectations were um uh beth this is this is something that i probably should have said uh, you're not allowed to google but um but i think that you know what what happens when i do this live is that um you know there are a lot of people in the room who don't know a lot about um the rio grande right and so you don't have the background knowledge so sometimes i've had people say um it has water in it <laughs> stuff like that right um because they're they're like well i don't know a whole lot of facts about it right and so our background knowledge comes into play and our you know the resources um uh and, and it seems like you had a really good strategy there kate like i'm not sure um you know it says there are many towns that are in close proximity to the rio grande uh and civilizations rely on it that could be like sort of general things that we know about rivers and you know in general um rather than something is like super specific about the Rio Grande but but you know these are strategies that we have to come up with if we don't if we're not sure what the expectations of the task are um and uh if we if we're not sure we know a lot of facts offhand I um, mean this is what we, what's challenging about um about uh, writing informational text is there anything else that's sort of challenging um for people with not instead of not just knowing about the not knowing a lot about the topic or is that about it? I guess the, the broadness of it, not knowing expectations, right? Um, things like that. So what would you need in order to be successful in this task? So let's flip it a little bit. Um, and I think I can guess a couple of things, but um, you know, what, what could be helpful if 
I was going to ask you to do this again. What could um, what could help you be more successful for those of you who didn't have didn't know a lot? Structure. Hebert, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Are we sort of in your principles of instruction and assessment now category of your presentation? Um, yeah, well, well, I had principles all the way through. Sorry. So um, yes, but, no, yeah. that's okay. I just I was sort of organizing my thoughts and my notes, and I was like, does this go? Like, are you done with your principles, and now this can go? Oh, on? I have principles of writing and and assessment okay. here too. Yeah. So okay. I, I'm sorry. I um, I should have mentioned that they're sort of like mixed throughout, Intertwined. right? So yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, a purpose structure, so understanding the purpose, understanding a structure could be helpful. What else um, could be helpful? More directions, clarity of what we're looking for. For those of you who didn't know a lot, um, how could we give you, how could we, how could we help you be more successful? We don't know any facts. Provide a text that could give some info, right? Um, that's great. So if we if we have kids do a little bit of reading first or provide them with some information beforehand, then they might be able to read a little bit more, or be I'm sorry, be able to write a little bit more, be more successful in the writing, right? Um, so here are some challenges. Uh, so sometimes uh, when, when kids are writing, they might have challenges with the executive function skills like working memory, inhibition, uh, their cognitive flexibility. Um, they might have uh, uh, fewer resources uh, when they're uh, available when they're writing. Um, in the simple view of writing, uh, you can see that uh, transcription skills like handwriting, keyboarding, and spelling are there at the bottom vertice of the triangle. And then you've got executive function skills like attention, planning, uh, revising strategies for self-regulation on the right-hand vertice. And, and if, you, if you have both of those things together, if you, can, if you have good transcription skills, you have good executive function skills, um, you can sort of, these things lead to text generation, right? So it allows you to sort of like, I can come up with good ideas, I can plan, I can organize my ideas and I have strategies for, for getting that information out. And then I can write those ideas down and I can spell them, right? But these things are constrained a little bit by working memory, right? And so what happens here is that if, if kids have uh, difficulty with attention and planning and revising, um, then they uh, the ideas that they produce are gonna be impacted, right? And so, um, struggling readers, if we ask them to write from source material, right, so if we give them a text, what we're doing is we're introducing a little bit of a layer of difficulty here, right, so what we're going to do is we're going to say, you know, hey, we know you don't have a lot of information about the Rio Grande River, so we're going to give you something to read. Now I've uh, made the task even more complex, right, so now now instead of uh, having just the reading, the writing uh, things that, that um, they have challenges with, now I'm introducing reading, they have to figure out how, what's the important information that they want me to write about. I've got to figure out how to take notes on those things and I've got to figure out how to organize uh, that information. And so asking kids to write from sources is, is a great idea, but it can also be challenging, right? So we can, we're adding sort of a new layer of complexity to this. Um, so one of the principles that I, I really want to say is, is when we're working with especially struggling readers and writers, what we want to try to do is reduce the cognitive load. And so, um, uh, so JP, I don't know uh, what your first name is, but the, you know, the idea to give text is really a, a good one, um, but we want to try to reduce cognitive load. So I'm going to show you how I might approach this by providing some information for kids. Um, and I really want to focus on, on an idea around something called sentence combining. And then I'll show you how that leads into um, text structure writing. So here's what sentence combining is here, right? So um, students combine sim simple sentences to make a um, more complex sentence, right? So here's an example. Example one, apples are fruit, bananas are fruit. If we need to put those together, I'll have you guys think about what, how would you put that together? And you might come up with apples and bananas are fruit, right? Um, another example here, we've got he is fat, he is jolly. Um, what would be uh, a way to combine those two sentences?
Kate, what are you thinking there? S super simple. He is fat and jolly. He is fat and jolly. I wish you were right. It's no, he is Santa Claus. Ah! Um, <laughs> I, I actually had a student um, uh, produce that for me once and uh, I thought it was like the best way to be wrong. Um, but the uh, point is, is that what we, what we can do is we can provide information for kids to write about. Here's an example of, uh, of for simple description of how we can help kids combine in, uh, information. So we've got, uh, I can teach them words like dense. Dense means like lots of parts crowded together, like just a simple, you know, student-friendly definition. And I can say, combine these sentences. Anteaters have dark fur. Their fur is dense, right? And we might combine it to say like, anteaters have dense dark fur or dark dense fur, right? Here's another example. Uh, humid is a lot of moisture in the air. Combine these sentences. Anteaters live in the rainforest. The rainforest is humid. And we might combine these to say, uh, anteaters live in the humid rainforest, right? Um, so we're really teaching kids how to use adjectives in this case. Um, how do you think this makes the task of writing easier for students. What are your thoughts? We've got exp explicit vocab that we're sharing. Yep, so we're giving them vocabulary, which is what, one of the things that we said is really important. We said when we're talking about informational text, we might come across words that uh, are only specific to a particular area. So we need to introduce that vocabulary. What else? Creating background knowledge, right? What else makes this a little bit easier for kids? Sorry, I was going to say background knowledge too, right? So we're so the, the idea here, right, is we don't have to, um, the kids don't have to come up with these ideas. The ideas are there for them. They can focus on rather than idea generation and saying like, I don't know what to write about. They can focus on, on the structure of the sentence, right? And how to put the sentence together, right? Anything else? Uh, Kate says bullet points versus sentences. Anything else you can think of? Sorry, I think I've got something on the next slide. So, you know, one of the things, you know, you, you guys got a couple of these things, right? Providing background knowledge, providing the challenging vocabulary. Kids don't have to think of the vocabulary. One of the other things that I, that I want you to sort of think about is reducing trans transcription demands, right? We said that in this um, simple view of writing, transcription skills and executive function skills are important, right? If kids are focused on spelling um, and they, they, how many people have worked with a student and they're, they're writing a sentence and they say, oh, can, how do I spell this word? You talk to them about spelling the word and then they get it spelled right and they finish it. And then they say, I forgot what I was going to say. Does that happen to any, anybody before, right? So what happens is the working memory, you know, the cognitive load is, is uh, increased you know, if kids don't know how to spell the word or if they're having difficulty with handwriting and then they they have difficulty with idea generation, right? So by providing the information here, what we've done is we, like words like anteaters, rainforest, humid, the kids don't have to think about how to spell those words anymore. They're there for them, right? And they can just think about the complexity of the sentence. And, how, and so what we've done is we, we've, we've taken away um, the background information part, we've taken away the challenging vocabulary and we've reduced the transcription demands. And by doing that, we can help the kids focus on just the, the organization of the sentence. So that's a really, a, a really strong principle of sentence combining and why it can be so powerful for kids. So I'm going to show you how to scaffold writing uh, using the information frames that I shared with you previously and by modeling, you know, for kids how to write, right? So, um, so here's an example. This is from uh, an intervention that I've been developing uh, called Structures. And, uh, and this, um, this uh, intervention focuses on, on teaching a lot of the principles that I've talked about today, right? So we've, we've 
taught kids, you know, when, when they get to this point, they already know how to identify the text structures. They can discriminate amongst them. They've learned how to take notes using frames like this one here. And then what I do is I give them um, a, uh, I give them an information frame and I teach them how to write, right? And so one of the things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna model for you how I model for the kids uh, how to write. And so uh, the first thing I do is I plan. Right. And I talk to the kids about planning and I've given them the information here. Right. So they have this in front of them. They don't have to know things like arthropods. They don't have to know how to spell the word jointed or uh, squeeze. They don't know, have to know how to spell the word skeleton. This information is provided for them. Uh, they don't have to come up with the ideas. Right. So what I do is I say, OK, the structure of, of this is going to be a simple description. And my topic is pill bugs. Okay, so, all right, I know the topic. I'm gonna to be writing about something called pill bugs and I have to describe the pill bugs, all right? So, and I've got a list of characteristics and facts here. They're arthropods, they have seven pairs of jointed legs, dark brown head, outer skeleton, can roll up and squeeze under things and a stripe down their back. Okay, so um, I teach them a strategy called POW where they have to like uh, plan, they have to write. And then, they, uh, so it's like pick my idea, uh, have an order for uh, those, uh, the information and then write. And so then I sort of teach them how to walk through this, uh, this plan. So first I identify those text, uh, the text structure and topic, and I've done that. Now I've got to think of an order for uh, how I want to write this. So what I've got to do here is I'm going to think about what order do I want to put these in, these in this information. Um, hmm. You know, I think I usually like to start, you know, it says that they're arthropods. I think that's really important information. So I'm gonna write that they're arthropods. I think that's where I wanna start my information. So I'm gonna put a, uh, uh, a number one next to that they are arthropods. All right, um, let's see. Well, I know that it says, it says a few things about their body. I, I think that maybe you know, something that if they're arthropods, maybe it has something to do with the, the them having seven pairs of jointed legs. So I'm going to put that second because I think that's important. Um, let's see. So then um, after they have seven pairs of jointed legs, I want to kind of stick with, uh, I think it's really interesting that they can roll up and squeeze under things, but I want to stick with like another other parts of their body because, so I'm going to stick with that they've got um, an outer skeleton here. I'm going to put that as third. So is that, because that's really sort of like, uh, important part of their body. And then um, let's see, um, you know, from there, I kind of want to say a little bit more about what they look like. So I think what I'm going to do is, is say that they've got this dark brown head and then a stripe down their back. Those, those are both, both sort of, I think, important about what they look like. And then I'm going to save that fun fact for can roll and squeeze under thing for last. So I'm going to put that um, as my, as my sixth thing there. So, um, all right. So now, um, I've identified the topic. I've put. I've chosen an order. So my next thing that I've got to do is write. All right. So, um, so here when I when I'm writing, what I do is I want to teach kids how to um, put this information together. Now that we have an order, um, I've got to write about it. So what's a good way to start? Well, it's about pill bugs, and I know that my first characteristic is that they are arthropods. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to want to identify my topic, but I want to you know, also include some important information. So I'm gonna say that pill bugs are arthropods. All right, and now that I've used that information, um, I can cross that off. I think that's important to say when I'm, when I'm describing something is first to identify what I'm describing. So pill bugs are arthropods. Now, um, I know that I've, I've said I've got uh, seven pairs of jointed legs, so I'm gonna put that second. And now when I do this, I don't wanna write pill bugs or arthropods, pill bugs have seven pairs of jointed legs, pill bugs have this. I want some variety in my sentences. So I'm gonna use uh, a pronoun and I'm gonna use the word they. So I'm gonna say they have seven pairs of jointed legs. Right? Um, all right, so the next I said that I was gonna talk about their uh, outer skeleton. Um, you know, sometimes good connector words are things that I want to include in my writing. So, you know, I could say pill bugs are arthropods. They have seven pairs of jointed legs. They have a dark brown head, but maybe I might want to use something like also. So I might say pill bugs. Uh, oh, I didn't, sorry. I'm, I'm in a, sorry, this is poor planning. Uh, I wanted to say pill bugs also have an outer skeleton. Sorry about that. Um, uh, and then let's see next, um, you know, stripe down their back and dark, and dark brown head. 
these are the next things I said I was going to write. I want to combine that information into a single sentence. So I'm going to say they have a dark brown head and a stripe down their back because I think that information can go together. And then finally, um, pill bugs can roll up and squeeze under things. And so I'll cross off the information. And so, um, so I think that this really, you know, I really liked the way that I um, put this together because it helped me uh, think about what the uh, you know topic was at the beginning, and then I described it, and then I saved that uh, fun fact for last. All right. So by providing information on writing and giving a model like this, what I've done is I've allowed the students focus to focus on the organization and relationship among the ideas, right? And so as I was writing, you could see that I was like really thinking about how do these ideas go together? What ideas do I wanna put first? How do I wanna um, organize that information? Um, and that does a lot of things for me, right? It reduces the demands of the writing task by, you know, one, I you know didn't have to come up with the ideas. Two, I didn't have to think about, you know, how to spell some of those tricky words like arthropods, right? Um, I also have a strategy for how to approach the task. I had a, I have a way to chunk the steps for the students. And then it, it, I can focus on things like cohesion elements, like signal words and transition words. So um, the idea here is what I've done is I've, I've sort of, uh, you know, by providing the uh, organization, you know, uh, what I've done is typically we say that for simple view, Transcription skills and executive functions lead to text generation. But instead here, what I've done is I've reduced the demands on working memory and I've reduced the transcription skills. And by doing that, instead of focusing on text generation, I can focus on the attention and planning and organization, right? And so what I've done is I've kind of flipped what the student needs to focus on in their writing. So now I want you to take a, a minute and I'm gonna, I'm giving you a topic here. This is an activity, plant and animal cells. What I'd like you to do now is I'd like you to write a passage about plant and animal cells, uh, compare contrast passage using the information in this frame, right? So I want you to just take a minute or two to write a paragraph about plant and animal cells. Okay, uh, I'm gonna cut this one a little bit short, but um, you guys kind of get the idea. One of the questions I have for you around this is how is this experience different from the Rio Grande prompt? And, and you know, what do you, do, did this, is this easier or, you know, how did, how did it make you approach the task a little differently? Sherry says it's engaging. Why was it more engaging? So you didn't have to kind of come up with information. You just had to kind of think about like, how does, how does the information go together? And so you got more engagement out of that. And I think that's really interesting. Um, you know, Daria says it's easier. You have information and direction for how to approach the task. Um, there's information to start from, right? And so you could really focus on, uh, Kate says she didn't have to focus on spelling. You could really just focus on like, how do I want to present this information, right? Do I want to talk about the similarities first? Do I want to talk about the differences first? 
Um, do I want to talk about, um, do I want to sort of alternate between similarities and differences? You know, and you could really think about how do I want to construct the sentences, right? And by doing that, you can really kind of help the kids understand that, okay, well, we're, when we, you know, when we are focused on text structure, writing informational text, we can, uh, we can construct, you know, organize the ideas in a, in a particular way to help our reader. Now, I didn't teach you guys how, you know, what I normally would do is teach kids how to write and compare contrast and teach them about all the different decisions that they could make um, when they, you know, you, you, could you write about all the similarities first and then all the differences or alternate, talking about those kinds of things. And you can see how this would help uh, kids focus on, on just the organization and, and the, you know, the ideas that they want to get out. Um, I'm just going to kind of skip over a couple of these things. We're running out of time here. So I want to um, uh, just share that, like, basically, when we are comparing and contrasting these things, um, what we, uh, sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go back to this. So basically, when I, when we, when we focus on teaching kids uh, how to, teaching kids how to write and we give them information, uh, we can potentially get a more engaging experience. We've reduced the cognitive load. We get them to focus on the, on the, uh, on the structure itself and how to present the information, right? Um, so those are the important parts. I wanted to just mention um, as, we, as we sort of close up that in this Rolling It Art All Out article that we have that, um, that I shared with John, um, we have unit plans uh, in there and we have unit plans for both younger uh, readers and older readers. And so you can see that what these unit plans often include are uh, lots of modeling and organization. There's going to be things around how to identify the text structures, uh, graphic organizer use, practice with writing. Uh, and so all of the different things. And we've got some ideas around assessment here too, like how to assess uh, whether or not kids are um, uh, you know, including enough examples, whether they're using good connecting words, whether they are connecting the ideas in a cohesive way uh, and things like that. Um, sorry, I'm kind of uh, running out of time. So I wanna just make sure that I save a few uh, minutes for discussion. So just wanna review these um, principles here around one of the things is building conceptual knowledge, teaching more than one text structure at a time, teaching identifying features or hallmarks of the structure like signal words, using things like guiding questions to facilitate understanding of the elements, using clear, simple examples before introducing more complex examples, um, uh, using writing to facilitate comprehension, trying to reduce the cognitive load um, for writing uh, when we're teaching that, and providing models for scaffolding the writing. So these are all the things that I would say, the, you know, if you can do these things when you're teaching informational text structures, um, these are going to be your, uh, really effective uh, ways to get your kids engaged uh, in the information and really, really improve their comprehension. So uh, I'll just stop there and, and leave a few minutes for questions uh, and discussion. Sorry, I feel like I kind of raced through that last part. <laughs> there was such good stuff leading up to it, though, Michael. So, <laughs> well, and and there is information in these articles that I shared too that that will sort of elaborate and build build out more around uh, the assessment pieces. Got a couple messages in the chat. Huh? Um, so I don't necessarily have, uh, Sherry, when you say book suggestions, you mean around text structure instruction specifically? Okay, yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't have any books that I know of that are like really focused just on that, that I would say, I would suggest basically the articles and I would read anything, uh, depends on your grade level, but like if you're interested in anything around elementary uh, readers, uh, and writers around this. I would read Joanna Williams's work. Uh, she has she does a really good job with her research. Uh, there's there are citations and things like that in the papers too that I shared, so you can you know kind of find some of those resources. Um, again, you have those two articles. One's very practical, and one's more research oriented. Do you find these things to be applicable across grades, Michael? Like even as you get up into middle and high school level? 
I do. Yeah. I think that um, what we, what you really need to do with, with struggling readers and writers uh, in the middle school and high school level, often, um, you know, you, you want to make sure that they understand the text structures first, right? So you want to go back to uh, the basics here, but then I think you want to really dig into the complexity of these text structures. So, so giving kids uh, opportunities to discuss um, what is the author trying to do here. Also writing more complex, you know, uh, examining their own writing and, and writing more complex uh, text. So saying, well, what, you know, giving them tasks like, first, I want you to start to describe your topic. Then I want you to compare your topic to another topic. And then I would like you to sort of write a problem and solution uh, ar around your topic. So doing that can really help the kids sort of think about, you know, their purpose as an author, what they want their uh, readers to know and things like that. Great, thanks. Yeah. Time for one last question, if anyone has it. Michael, I wanna thank you. You, this was really practical and, and good stuff. And uh, folks, I will send out those uh, links that Dr. Aber uh, shared with me tomorrow morning, along with a link that uh, if you could provide just a couple minutes of evaluation from today, that would be really helpful for us. And uh, as always, if you have questions, you can contact uh, us at the Technical Assistance Center. So with that, I hope you have a wonderful evening, folks. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in October when, Michael, you come back in October, right? For Yeah, to do um, really foundational skill instruction around writing. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for your Santa Claus joke. <laughs> <laughs>